stories one and two of st andrew's ghost stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by david wales st andrew's ghost stories by william thomas linskill story one the beckoning monk many years ago about the time of the tay bridge gale i was staying at edinburgh with a friend of mine an actor manager i had just come down from the paint-room of the theatre and was emerging from the stage door when i encountered miss elsie h a then well-known actress you are just the very person i wanted to meet she said allow me to introduce you to my friend mr spencer ashton he's not an actor he's an artist and he's got such a queer queer story about ghosts and things near your beloved st andrews i bowed to mr ashton who was a quiet-looking man pale and thin rather like a benevolent animated hairpin he reminded me somehow of fred volks we shook hands warmly yes he said my story sounds like fiction but it is a fact as i can prove it is rather long but it may possibly interest you where could we foregather come and dine with me at the edinburgh hotel to-night at eight i'll get a private room i said right oh said he and we parted that evening at eight o'clock we met at the old edinburgh hotel now no longer in existence and after dinner he told me his very remarkable tale some years ago he said i was staying in a small coast town in fife not very far from st andrews i was painting some quaint houses and things of the sort that tickled my fancy at the time and i was very much amused and excited by some of the bogey tales told me by the fisher folk one story particularly interested me and what was that i asked well it was about a strange dwarfish old man who they swore was constantly wandering about among the rocks at nightfall a queer uncanny creature they said who was aye beckoning to them and who was never seen or known in the daylight i heard so much at various times and from various people about this old man that i resolved to look for him and see what his game really was i went down to the beach times without number but saw nothing worse than myself and i was almost giving the job up as hopeless when one night i struck oil as the yankees would say good i said let me hear it was after dusk he proceeded very rough and windy but with a feeble moon peeping out at times between the racing clouds i was alone on the beach next moment i was not alone not alone i remarked who was there certainly not alone said ashton about three yards from me stood a quaint short shrivelled old creature at that time the comic opera of pinafore was new to the stage-loving world and this strange being resembled the character of dick deadeye in that piece but this old man was much uglier and more repulsive he wore a tattered monk's robe had a fringe of black hair heavy black eyebrows very protruding teeth and a pale pointed unshaven chin moreover he possessed only one eye which was large and telescopic looking what a horrid brute i said oh he wasn't half so bad after all said ashton though his appearance was certainly against him he kept beckoning to me with a pale withered hand continually muttering come i felt compelled to follow him and follow him i did i lit up another pipe and listened intently he took me resumed ashton into a natural cave a cleft in the rocks and we went stumbling over the rocks and stones and splashing into pools at least i did he seemed to get along all right at the far end of this clammy cave a very narrow staircase cut out of solid rock ascended abruptly about twenty or thirty steps then turned a corner and descended again into a large passage then a mighty queer thing happened what might that be i inquired well my guide somehow or other suddenly became possessed of a huge great candlestick with a lighted candle in it about three feet high which lit up the vaulted passage we now stand in the monk's subway he said indeed and who may you be are you a man or a ghost the queer figure turned 
i am human he said do not fear me i was a monk years ago now i am reincarnate time and space are nothing whatever to me i only arrived a short while ago from naples to meet you here good heavens ashton i said is this all true absolutely true my dear fellow said ashton i was in my sound senses not hypnotized or anything of that sort i assure you on and on we went the little man with his big candle leading the way and i following two or three times the subway narrowed and we had a tight squeeze to get through i can tell you what a rum place i interjected yes it was that said ashton but it got still rummer as we went up and down more stairs and then popped through a hole into a lower gallery and i noticed side passages branching off in several different directions walk carefully and look where you tread said my monkish guide there are pitfalls here be very wary then i noticed at my feet a deep rock-hewn pit about two feet wide right across the passage what is that for i asked to trap intruders and enemies said the little monk look down i did so and i saw at the bottom in a pool of water a whitened skull and a number of bones we passed four or five such shafts in our progress upon my word this beats me altogether i interpolated it would have beaten me altogether if i had fallen into one of those traps said ashton suddenly the close damp fungus sort of air changed and i smelt a sweet fragrant odour i smell incense i said to the monk it is the wraith or ghost of a smell he said there has been no incense hereaway since fifteen forty six there are ghosts of sounds and smells just as there are ghosts of people we are here surrounded by spirits but they are transparent and you cannot see them unless they are materialized but you can feel them hush hark said the monk and then i heard a muffled sound of most beautiful chiming bells the like i never heard before what is that the old bells of st andrew's cathedral that is the ghost of sounds long ago ceased and the monk muttered some latin then all of a sudden i heard a very beautiful chanting for a moment or more then it died away that is the long dead choir of monks chanting vespers remarked my guide sadly at this period the monk and i entered a large rock-hewn chamber wide and lofty in it there were numerous huge old iron clamped chests of different sizes and shapes these said the monk are packed full of treasures jewels and vestments they will be needed again some day above us now there are ploughed fields but long ago right over our heads there existed a church and monastery to which these things belonged he pointed with a skinny claw of a hand to one corner of the chamber there he said is the staircase that once led to the church above ashton stopped and lit a cigar and then resumed well on we went again turning twisting going up steps round corners through more holes and stepping over pitfall shafts it was a loathsome and gruesome place out of a side passage i saw a female figure glide quickly along she was dressed as a bride for a wedding and then she disappeared fear not said the monk that is mirren of hepburn's tower the white lady she can materialize herself and appear when she chooses but she is not reincarnate as i am well after we had gone on it seemed for hours as i have described the monk paused i fear i must leave you he said suddenly i am wanted before i go take this and he placed in my hand a tiny gold cup delicately chased it is a talisman and will bring you good luck always he said keep it safe i may never see you again here but do not forget then i was alone in black darkness he and his candle had vanished in a second quite alone in that awful prison heaven only knows how far below the ground i could never have gone back and i feared to go forward i was entombed in a worse place than the roman catacombs with no hope of rescue as it was unknown and forgotten by all what a fearful position to be in i said 
i should think it was said ashton the awful horror of it i can never forget as long as i live i was absolutely powerless and helpless i had lost my nerve and i screamed aloud in an agony of mind i had some matches and these i used at rare intervals crawling carefully and feeling my way along the slimy floor of the passage i had a terrible feeling too that something intangible but horrible was crawling along after me and stopping when i stopped i heard it breathing i struck a match and it was lucky for i just missed another of those pitfalls by the light of the match i saw a small shrine in an alcove which had once been handsomely ornamented my progress forward was suddenly stopped by a gruesome procession of skeleton monks all in white they crossed the main subway from one side passage and entered another their heads were all grinning skulls and in their long bony fingers they bore enormous candles which illuminated the passage with a feeble blue glare it's awful i remarked on and on i slowly went it seemed hours and hours i was exhausted and hungry and thirsty after a time i passed through open oak nail-studded doors that were rotting on their hinges and then then i saw a sight so horrible that i would never mention it to any one i dare not i may know its meaning some day i hope so what on earth was it i inquired eagerly for heaven's sake let me go on and do not ask about it said ashton turning ghastly pale the horror of the whole thing so upset me that my foot slipped and i fell down what seemed to be a steep stairway as i struck the bottom i felt my left wrist snap and i fainted when i regained my senses for a brief moment i found that the white lady bearing a taper was bending kindly over me she had a lovely face but as pale as white marble she laid an icy cold hand on my hot brow and then all was darkness again now listen next time i came to myself and opened my eyes i was out of the accursed passage i saw the sky and the stars and i felt a fresh breeze blowing oh joy i was back on the earth again that i knew i staggered feebly to my feet and where on earth do you think i found i had been lying i cannot guess i said just inside the archway of the old pen's gateway at st andrews said ashton how on earth did you get there heaven knows said ashton i expect the white lady helped me somehow it all seemed like a fearful nightmare but i had the gold cup in my pocket and my broken wrist to bear testimony to what i had gone through to make a long story short i went home to my people where i lay for six long weeks suffering from brain fever and shock i always carry the cup with me i am not superstitious but it brings me good luck always ashton showed me the monk's gold cup it was a beautiful little relic did you ever examine the place where you entered the passage i asked oh yes he replied i went there some years afterwards and found the cave but it was all fallen in now by jove it's very late thanks for the dinner i must be off good night i lit a pipe and pondered over that curious story the entrance to the passage in the cave has fallen in the exit from it in st andrews is unknown to ashton only the white lady knows on the whole the story is wrapped in mystery and it does not help one much to unravel the wonders that lie in underground st andrews we may know some day or never end of story one story two the hauntings and mysteries of lowstry castle it is many years ago since i was on a walking tour in the highlands far to the north of bonnie glenshee and when on the moorlands i was overtaken for my sins by a regular american snowstorm a genuine blizzard of the most pronounced type i struggled along as well as i could for some considerable time and then i became aware that some one was beside me it was a young highland lassie with a plaid over her head i was pleased to learn from her that her name was jean that she was the niece of a neighbouring innkeeper and that she would speedily convey me to his haven of rest 
we trudged along in the blinding snow without a word and i was more than thankful to the lassie when i at last found myself out of the snow in a nice little sanded parlour with a glorious fire of peat and logs blazing on the hospitable hearth a glass of something hot brought by mine host was most welcome i found there was one other storm-strayed traveller in the wee house an old family butler whose name i discovered was jeremiah anklebone he had been on a visit to relations in the north and had been caught in the snow like myself we were thankful to find such a warm cosy shanting on such an inclement evening and to use a scots term we foregathered at the ingle inside he asked me if i knew much about spirits to which i replied that i had just had a glass but he at once explained that although not averse to toddy he alluded to spirits of another nature viz ghosts banshees boggards and the like i told him i had frequently been in so-called haunted places in various countries but had never seen or heard anything except owls bats rats or mice he ventured the remark i had often heard before that i could not be receptive and i told him i was thankful that i was not he was a fine old fellow an ideal family butler and doubtless the recipient of many family secrets he had big mutton-chop whiskers and a bald head and looked as if he had served turtle soup all his life but it was not soup he was soaked with he seemed fairly saturated with spook lore he informed me quite calmly that he was gifted with the remarkable faculty of seeing apparitions demons etc i could not help remarking that it seemed a very unpleasant faculty to possess but he quite differed with me and got as warm as his toddy on the subject i shall not in a hurry forget that wild evening in the highland inn before that blazing fire or the wonderful narrations i heard from butler anklebone space precludes me from putting down here all the marvels he revealed to me it seemed all his life he was sixty-two he had been gasping like a fish on a river's bank to get into a really well-haunted house but had utterly failed till he took the post of head butler at lousdry castle which he informed me was but a short distance from st andrews he gave me a most tremendous description of the old castle and from his account it seemed to be the asylum and gathering place of all the bogies in britain and elsewhere congregated together there were the ice maid the brown lady a headless man a called lad a black maiden the flaming ghost the wandering monk a ghost called silky old martha a radiant bay an iron knight a creeping ghost jumping jock old no legs great eyes a talking dog the corby craw a floating head a dead hand bleeding footprints and many other curious creatures far too numerous to mention the castle he said was full of uncouth and most peculiar sights and sounds including rappings hammerings shrieks groans crashings wailings and the like what a remarkable place i said to mr butler anklebone and how do you account for so many spectres in so limited an area oh there is no time or space for them he said they are earthbound spirits and can go from one part of the globe to another in a second but they have their favourite haunts and meeting-places just as we folks have and lousdray seems to appeal to their varied taste he then went on to tell me some details of the haunted castle there are supposed to be he said beneath the castle splendid old apartments dungeons winding passages and cellars but history states that any of those persons who tried to investigate these mysteries returned no more so the entrances were walled up and are now completely lost sight of there is a built-up chamber but no one durst open it the penalty being total blindness or death and such cases are on record there is also a coffin room shaped exactly like its name but one of the queerest places at lousdry is a small apartment with a weird light of its own at night this room can be seen from the old garden showing a pale uncanny phosphorescent glow mr snaggers uh, that's the footman and i unlocked the door and examined the place carefully 
there is a table a sofa and a few old chairs therein and an all-pervading sickly light equally diffused the furniture throws no shadow whatever the room seemed very chilly and there was a feeling as if all one's vitality was being sucked out of one's body and drawing one's breath caused pain snaggers felt the same no one could live long in that eerie apartment i know we were glad to lock it up again then there is a spiral stair called meg's leg i don't know the legend but almost every night one hears her leg stumping up these steps what a creepy place it must be to be sure i murmured gravely yes said anklebone and i tell you sir snaggers and i generally arranged to go up to bed together one always felt there was something coming up the stairs behind one when a person stopped it stopped also and one could hear it breathing and panting but nothing was to be seen snaggers said one night when the candle went out he saw monstrous red eyes but i saw nothing then the creeping creature i only saw twice it was like an enormous toad on spider's legs they say it has a human head and face but i only saw its back some folks say it is alive and not a ghost and that it hides somewhere in the cellars but we never could get a trace of it one night i was going down to the service room when my way was barred by a ghastly tall figure with great holes where eyes should have been so i just shut my eyes and rushed through it downstairs when i got down i found all my clothes were covered with a vile sickly smelling sticky sort of oil and i had to destroy them all go on please i said you astonish me vastly yes he said slowly it's all very queer lousdry is haunted and no mistake snaggers and i shared the same room one night a great blood-stained hand and arm came round the corner of the bed curtain and tried to grab me it was dead ice cold too then a thing an invisible thing used to patter into the room puffing and groaning and get under the bed and heave it up but we looked and there was never anything there and the door locked too we saw a great black corkscrew thing one night fall from the ceiling onto the floor and disappear and then there was a mighty rush along the passage outside the door a great crash a yell and a groan dying away far below there was a humorous spirit also the iron knight we called him uncle he was up to tricks we didn't mind him when the fat cook was sitting down to a meal he'd pull back her chair and down she would come with a rare crash if any of the maids upset a tray of tea things or fell downstairs with the kettle or knocked over the great urn they used to say ah that's uncle again i told him mr anklebone that i was delighted there was a touch of comedy in such a gruesome place as i preferred comedians to ghosts any day one thing i learnt from his story and that was that if he was head butler at law street castle the head ghost was sir guy ravelstock whose portrait still hung in the old picture gallery the castle dated back to norman times but about fourteen fifty seven it fell into the hands of this sir guy ravelstock who had been educated at the stadium general or university of st andrews he and his two friends geoffrey de beaumanoir and roger le courville held high revel and carnival in the old halls of lowsdry and were the terror of the whole countryside sir guy was a dissolute fellow a gambler and everything else bad the neighbours alleged that he had sold himself to old nick he would spill blood as if it was water and he and his white steed nogo were well known all over fife and the lothians he was held to be a freebooter a wizard and a warlock a highwayman a pirate and a general desperado he had slain many men in mortal combat and was found invulnerable he must have been a sort of michael scott of bowery i remarked he must have been a holy terror said the butler i've seen him often exactly like his portrait in the picture gallery i've seen him in his old world dress with his sword hanging at his side sometimes on his white horse and sometimes on foot 
there were always terrible knocking shrieks and crashes before he appeared and all our dogs showed the greatest terror i slept in an old four-poster bed and he used to draw aside the curtain and glare at me constantly he nearly always was accompanied by the spectre of a negro carrying his head under his arm sir guy was a great traveller in foreign lands and i have been told used to bring back all sorts of curious animals and insects with him perhaps that great toad thing i saw was one of the creatures i've heard toads live for ages i said i believed that was quite true i found a queer place one day said anklebone i was going up the turret staircase and found some of the steps moved back i got mr snaggers and dark good the gardener and we tugged them out we called the master and then we found narrow steps going down to a locked door we forced it open and got into a stone chamber there were skulls and bones all over the place most of them belonged to animals but there was a horrible thing on the floor a sort of mummified vampire bat with huge teeth and enormous outstretched wings like thick parchment and four legs perhaps it was a regular vampire they fanned folks to sleep with their great wings and then sucked their blood dry we cleared out the room and buried all the things in a wood now said anklebone i will tell you the end of sir guy ravelstock he brought back with him from them foreign parts a nigger servant and they called him the apostle well one night continued anklebone he and his chum were dining and full of wine and the apostle offended them somehow and sir guy stabbed him then they chained his hands and feet together took him to the dungeon and filled his mouth nose and ears full of clay and left him that is the nigger ghost i saw always with sir guy the murdered negro about two years after sir guy and his friends were in the same room drinking when there came a great hammering at the castle door sir guy drew his sword flung open the door and plunged out into the darkness a few moments passed then his friends rushed out on hearing wild unearthly shrieks but there was no sir guy to be seen he had totally disappeared and was never heard of or seen in life again we found his remains three years ago but i will tell you of that directly one day snaggers and i had gone to st andrews to buy things we were just at the end of south street when a horseman dashed past us at full gallop heavens said snaggers it's sir guy as i live he went bang into the big iron gates at the cathedral when we came up the great gates were locked and there was sir guy leaning up against the west gable scowling at us but the white horse had gone and he melted away as we looked i saw him again with the negro at magus muir and alone one dark night in north street i was alone one evening in the room below the banquet hall at lowsdry and i heard a pattering on the table on looking up i saw a stain in the ceiling and drops of blood were dropping down on the table and the floor the room above was the very place where the negro was stabbed next morning we went into the room where i saw the blood drip and there was the mark of a bloody hand on the table but no stain on the roof now for the discovery i had often dreamed about an old overgrown well there was in the gardens and felt very suspicious of what might be therein then the gardener and the woodman told me they had frequently seen the awful spectre of sir guy and the apostle hovering round about the thicket that enclosed what was known as the haunted well and then vanish in the brushwood without disturbing it i felt sure that there lay the mystery of sir guy ravelstock this idea was soon after confirmed by a curious occurrence one morning snaggers was dusting an old oil painting over the huge mantelpiece and above the weeping stone in the great hall when somehow or other he contrived to touch a secret spring and the painting flew back open in its frame and revealed a chamber beyond we sent for master and got down by some steps into the room such a queer place it was octagonal in shape and there had been either a great fire or an explosion there 
the vaulted stone roof and floor were all blackened and cracked and the fireplace and wood panelling were all burnt and charred perhaps the chapel i remarked that is what master said replied the butler and there were remains of burnt tapestry charred wood and documents all over the stone floor master got one piece of burnt paper with faded writing on it in some foreign tongue the odd thing was the big picture the eyes were sort of convex like and two holes were bored in the pupil of each of its eyes so that any one standing up on top of the stone stairs could see all that took place in the great hall below and hear also master took the piece of parchment and managed to make out a few words they were i am sure that ravelstock lies in the cold priors well with the dead nigger servant we placed there i would not go near that spot for my life heaven grant it may not come for me i must leave the place that was all he could decipher on the burnt paper we must explore that priors well evidently that is its name to-morrow morning said our master we were all up at dawn and got all the men available to cut down the shrubs bushes and undergrowth round the well the growth of ages when the well was exposed it looked very like the holy well at st andrews only it had been very finely carved and ornamented at one time the entrance was a norman archway and the remains of an oak door still hung there we found a shallow bath-shaped pool of muddy water inside and a lot of broken stones and bits of old statues and glass at the far end was a large square opening a few feet above the pool of water we of course made for this and found there was a cell beyond the whole well on one side was riven and rent either by lightning or the effects of an earthquake shock if that ancient well could have spoken it would have told us as queer tales as st rule's tower at st andrews there was a most curious overpowering sickening odour inside the place like a vault or charnel house i remarked that i knew no smells worse than a settling gas or the awful smell i unearthed when digging long ago opposite the st andrews cathedral well said anklebone i can't imagine a worse odour than there was beside that prior's well it turned us all so faint we had to get some brandy we got into the far cell and there were two skeleton bodies on the flagged floor one was a blanched skeleton as far as the neck but the skull was well preserved and matted black hair still clung on it and round the jaws all the teeth were in their place some rings had fallen from the bony fingers and a sword all eaten away by rust lay beside the skeleton the other was like a mummified ape of a dark oak colour the nails on the fingers and toes being quite perfect chains also almost worn away hung round the feet and hands good heavens said master it is sir guy ravelstock and the murdered apostle there was no doubt of that whatever we had them removed and buried at once the mystery was solved after all these long years the nigger had been placed there but the mystery of sir guy was inexplicable who came for him that night when he rushed out of the door of lowestry castle centuries ago with his sword and who carried him to his doom in the friar's well no one can answer that terrible question now oh that the old well could speak and reveal its secret end of story two stories three and four of st andrew's ghost stories by william thomas linskill this librivox recording is in the public domain story three a haunted manor house and the duel at st andrew's or the old brown witch this can hardly be termed a st andrew's ghost story but it is so remarkably strange and weird that i have been specially requested to add it to the series and there is an allusion to st andrew's in it after all several years ago we had in the golf club at cambridge a russian prince who took up golf and the question of spirits bogies witches banshees death warnings and the like equally strongly 
he was a firm disbeliever in all of them and belonged to a phantasmological research society to inquire into and expose all such things i frequently have long letters from him from all sorts of remote parts of the world where he is investigating tales of haunted houses churchyards and so on but from this his last letter he seems to have contrived to meet a genuine and very unpleasant sort of spectre of course i suppress all names xx manor february mm, 1905 dear w t l well here i am actually in a really haunted manor house at last and i have had a most horribly weird and uncanny experience of a most loathsome appearance i have been here a fortnight now such a queer great old house all turrets and towers and damp wings covered with ivy and creepers and such small narrow windows it is on a slight elevation and has in bygone days had a moat around it it is surrounded by dense woods and there is a black-looking lake at the back the staircases are all stone and very narrow and there is an old chapel and a coffin room in the house in the garden in a yew avenue is a vault and a tombstone and thereby hangs my curious tale it seems that centuries ago a very unpleasant old widow lady and a very unpleasant son had the old house she was a very ugly and eccentric creature and a miser and was nicknamed by the village folk the brown witch the tales about her ongoings told to this day are most remarkable it seems her son who according to all accounts was a shocking bad lot was killed in a duel and the old lady died shortly afterwards a raving maniac she seems to have left a very curious will i deal with only two details in it one was that the chamber in which she lived and died was forever to be left untouched and undisturbed but unlocked or the disturber would be cursed with instant blindness and ultimately death the second was that she was to be buried in the vault in the yew avenue that she had specially made for her remains that she was to be dressed in her usual clothes and bonnet and that she must be placed in a tightly sealed glass coffin so as to be visible to any intruder my host told me the chamber or the vault in the grounds had never been interfered with but that her appearances had been very frequent to most credible witnesses and that such appearances all portended some dire calamity to some one she had appeared and terrified many visitors both in the house and in the grounds she had also been seen by the village pastor and by the servants he had never seen her himself but he had taken every measure he could think of to unravel the mystery but in vain the outdoor servants were terrified and would never remain and one lady visitor had been nearly driven mad by seeing her peering in at the window at dusk of course i laughed the tale to scorn and also the story of the alarm bell which told at intervals without any apparent or human agency not even the bravest would dare to walk down the yew avenue after nightfall well i had been ten days in the house before anything happened i must say the wind and the rats and owls and bats and the tapping noise of the ivy on the old windows at night were rather creepy but nothing really out of the common happened till the other night my room was in a long narrow old gallery after cards and billiards and at about twelve thirty i was going off to my well-earned rest and was getting near my door in the gallery when i saw a faint light coming towards me round a corner i went into my room and waited to see who was wandering about so late at night then a figure stopped at my door evidently carrying a lighted old lantern i raised my candle to have an inspection and then oh horror i staggered back for a moment for before me clearly stood the horrible figure of the old brown witch a cold sweat broke out all over me 
far far worse than the description i saw her brown robe and the poke bonnet the horrible face the huge black sockets of the eyes without eyeballs the nose gone and worst of all that fearful grin the cruel grin of a maniac a wicked terrible face i opened my drawer and seized my always loaded revolver i shouted loudly and fired once twice thrice she never moved only the horrible mocking smile grew wider and more devilish i rushed forward slammed my door to shut out the awful sight and then collapsed back into a chair i must have hit it each time for certain an offensive charnel house smell pervaded the air then the door flew open and my hosts and several men and servants rushed into the room anxiously asking what was the matter and why i fired i told them everything we found the three bullet shots in the wall opposite my door they must have passed through that abominable horror need i say i spent a wretched night in fact i sat up and never went to bed at all i resolved to leave next day early but before doing that i determined at all hazards to go into that vault and see what it contained and also to carefully investigate the brown witch's chamber without disturbing anything in it i told my host next day at breakfast what i proposed doing and he offered no objection whatever but declined absolutely to go near the vault or chamber himself or to let any of his household do so oh by the by did you ring the alarm bell in the tower last night he asked me it was the sound of your shots and the great bell ringing immediately afterwards that brought me along so quickly to your room we all heard it i told him i knew nothing of it and never even heard the bell i thought that he said for you were nearly off in a faint when we all came in and hardly knew us for a bit i can't make out the bell said my host or what on earth can make it ring so it has no rope and it cannot possibly be the wind i must have it removed last time it rung loudly like that my old housekeeper was found dead in her bed in the morning to make a long story short the next thing i did was to get a couple of laborers to shovel away the earth and find the lid of the old vault in the yew avenue this was soon done and we quickly descended into the place with lights we found ourselves in a large built clammy chamber and on the floor lay a tattered and broken old lantern at first we thought the chamber was empty but all of a sudden we noticed a niche at one end and at once went forward to it in this singular alcove was a large glass box or coffin standing on its end and in it and standing upright was the horrible eyeless mummy still arrayed in the brown robe and poke bonnet of the terrible creature i had seen in the gallery and with the same mocking grinning mouth and the huge ugly teeth the same smell i have told you of before pervaded the whole place she was hermetically sealed up in this ghastly glass coffin and preserved we were all very glad to leave that charnel house and cover it up out of sight but not out of memory that would be perfectly impossible to any of us i can't get that smell out of my nose yet it would sicken you next i went to the chamber with a friend and my bicycle lantern to investigate it was up a long narrow stone stair the old oak door it was unlocked as i said before soon yielded to our combined efforts and creaked open and we stood in a room of the middle ages the old shutters were tightly closed the ceiling which had once been handsomely painted was rapidly falling away and the tapestry was rotting off the walls it had evidently once been a splendid apartment but now it was given up to rats and moths and spiders and damp it chilled one to the very marrow and it had that same horrible smell there was a four-poster bed in one corner with rags and shreds of curtains probably where the old creature had died the tables and chairs were covered with the dust of ages there was no carpet of any kind an old spinet stood against the wall and papers were lying all over the place inches deep in dust 
a few charred logs of wood lay in the gaping old fireplace with its old-time chimney corners and there seemed to be bits of valuable old china and bric-a-brac about the place many pictures had fallen off the walls but a few faded pencil drawings were still in their places just guess my surprise and astonishment when i found they were scottish views one of edinburgh one of crail church and three of st andrews including the old college and chapel the castle and st leonard's college with date 1676 here was another most curious thing i determined to ask about before i left however i touched nothing in the room as i had promised my host and besides you will laugh i had no wish to be stricken with the brown witch's promised curse of blindness and ultimate death to any intruder who touched her things i dreaded her far too much since i had seen her in the gallery and in her tomb and heard of her bewitched alarm bell which portended death to some one before i left i mentioned the scottish drawings in the witch's room to my host and asked him if he could throw any light on how they came there briefly it seems that she the witch sent her son far away in those old days to a scottish university and st andrews was her choice it seems he was very quarrelsome in his cups and frequently fought duels and generally proved the victor one of the last he fought at sochip stone near crail with a nephew of the laird of balcomy castle and they fought with broadsword and buckler and again the witch's son killed his man his last duel was fought on st andrew's sands with rapiers and he was run through the heart a good job now i must conclude i am determined to investigate further the whole most mysterious affair if you ever visit this place my host mr blank says he will let you explore the vault in the yew avenue and see the coffin and the old witch and you may also go and look at the chamber if you ever do take the advice of an old friend and do not dare to touch anything therein your old friend to command end of story three story four the apparition of the prior of pittenham it was in september eighteen seventy five that i first met dear old captain chester now gone to his rest and it was very many years before that date that he rented his fearsomely haunted old house in st andrews i was a cambridge boy when i met him how the undergraduates scorn that term boy he told me the following queer tales in the Popeldorf Avenue at Bonn when I was on holiday. The house he rented at St. Andrews, from his account, must have been a most unpleasant and eerie dwelling. Rappings and hammerings were heard all over the house after nightfall, trembling of the walls, quiverings, heavy falls, and ear-piercing shrieks were also part of the nightly program i suggested bats rats owls and smugglers as the cause which made the old man perfectly wild with rage and caused him to use most unparliamentary language i pointed out that such language would probably have scared away any respectable ghost however let me tell the story in his own peculiar way my brother and i took the house sir he said and we had a nephew and some nieces with us there were also three middle-aged english servants at the time and gadsooth sir they had strange names the cook possessed the extraordinary name of maria trombone the housemaid was called jemima podge and the other old cat was called teresa shadbolt one evening i was sitting smoking in my study when the door flew open with a bang and maria rushed in zounds mrs trombone i said how dare you come into my room like this well sir she said there are awful things going on to-night i'm frighted to death i was washing out please sir when something rushed past me with a rustle and i got a great smack on the cheek with a damp cold hand and then the place shook and all the things clattered like nothing nonsense trombone i said you were asleep or have you been drinking eh? lor bless you sir no never a drop 
but last night sir teresa shadbolt had all the bedclothes pulled off her bed twice sir and jane said a tall old man in a queer dressing gown came into her room and brushed his white beard over her face and lord sir didn't you hear her a screamin no i'm hanged if i did you must be stark staring mad you know not a bit of us master continued mrs trombone there is something wrong about this blessed house locked doors and windows fly wide open and the bells keep ringing at all hours of the night and we hear steps on the stairs when every one is in bed and knocks and crashes and screams then the tables and things go moving about no christian could put up with it please sir we must all leave well i got all those women up and they told me deuced queer things but i squared them up at last how i inquired i doubled their wages sir and i told them they might all sleep in one room upstairs together and i promised them a real good blow-out at christmas and so on next my nephew and little nieces saw the old man with the long white beard at various times in the passages and on the stairs oddly enough my little nieces got quite accustomed to see the aged man with the grey beard and were not a bit timid they said he was just like the pictures of old father christmas and he looked kind i never saw him continued chester till one all hallows night or halloween as they termed it at st andrews but i will speak of that later on go on i said it is very interesting indeed to me the servants all saw him at times and that old arch fiend trombone was constantly getting frightened and breaking things and fainting i was myself annoyed by strange unearthly sounds when sitting smoking at night late there were curious rollings and rumblings under the house like enormous stone balls being bowled along then a heavy thud followed by intolerable silence then there was a curious sound like muffled blinds being quickly drawn up and down that and a sort of flapping and rustling seemed to pervade the air this perplexed me and i got in a detective but he found out nothing at all after much trouble and research i learned of the legend of the prior of pittism and his connection with the old house it seems when moray and his gang of plunderers shut up st monnet's church and the old priory of pittiswim the last prior not foreman or rowles a very old man was cut adrift and for some months lay hidden at newark castle food being brought him by some former monks newark castle was burned and this old prior fled to balcomy castle from there he went to kinkle cave near st andrews oh, i know all those places well i said after some weeks and when winter came he took refuge in the very old house in which i lived he seems to have been among both friends and foes there and brawls were quite common things within those walls one night those long dead and forgotten old world inhabitants were startled from their slumbers by shots the clashing of arms and wild yells to make a long tale short that old prior of pittenham was never seen by human eyes after that fearful night many suspected foul play but in those times it was deemed best to keep one's mouth shut tight and what mattered it if an old prior disappeared they were awful times those i said glad we live in these days well now said the captain i must come to the night of all halloween or holy even when the spirits of the night are said to wander abroad we dined early in those days and after dinner i walked down to an old club-house in golf place of which i was an honourable member to play cards it was a perfect night and a few flakes of snow had begun to fall and the wind was keen and sharp when i left the club later the ground was well covered with snow but the storm had ceased and the moon and stars were shining bright in a clear sky by jove sir it was like a fairyland and all the church towers and housetops were glittering in the moonbeams i wandered about the old place for fully an hour it was lovely i was reluctant to go indoors gad sir i got quite sad and poetical i thought of my poor sister who died long ago and is buried in stefano rodundo in rome and lots of other things then i thought of st andrews as it is and what it might have been 
i thought of all its holy temples erected by our pious forefathers and its altars and statues lying desolate ruined and profaned at last i arrived at my own door and entered in a thoughtful mood i went to my study and put on my slippers and dressing-gown i had just sat down and commenced reading when there came a most tremendous shivering crash i involuntarily cowered down i thought the roof had fallen at least gad sir i was flabbergasted it woke every one the crash was followed by a roaring sound it must have been an earthquake captain chester i said zounds sir i don't know what it was i thought i was killed then my nephew and i got a lamp and examined the house everything was right nothing to account for the fearful noise finally we went downstairs to the vaulted kitchens zounds sir all of a sudden my nephew gripped my arm and with a cry of abject terror pointed to the open kitchen door oh look there look there he almost screamed i looked and gad i got a queer turn there facing us in the open doorway was a very tall shaven-headed old man with a long gray beard he had a white robe or cassock on a linen rocket and above all an almus or cloak of black hue lined with ermine the augustinian habit in one hand he held a very large rosary and he leant on a stout cudgel as i advanced he retreated backwards always beckoning to me and i followed lamp in hand i had to follow could not help myself do you know the way a serpent can fascinate or hypnotize its prey before it devours them oh yes i said i have seen the snakes at the zoo do that trick well sir i was hypnotized like that precisely like that he beckoned and i followed suddenly i saw a little door in the corner of the kitchen standing open a door i had never noticed before the shadowy vision backed towards it still i followed then he entered its portals as i advanced he grew more and more transparent and finally melted away and the heavy door shut upon him with a tremendous crash and rattle the lamp fell from my trembling hand and was shattered to fragments on the stone floor i was in pitch darkness silence reigned i don't remember how i got to the light again next morning early i got in some workmen and took them down to the kitchen direct to the corner where the door was through which the apparition vanished the previous night zounds sir there was no door there only the white plastered wall i was dumbfounded mrs trombone i said to the cook where the devil is that door gone the door sir said the cook there ain't no door there that i ever saw trombone i replied don't tell falsehoods you're a fool i made the men set to work and tear down the plaster and stuff and egad sir in an hour we found the door a thick oak nail-studded iron clamped old door it took some time to force it open and then down three steps we found ourselves in a chamber with mighty thick walls and with a flagged floor about six feet square lit by a small slit of a window tear up the flags i said they did so and there was only earth below dig down i said dig like thunder in about an hour we came to a huge flag with a ring in it up it came and below it was a dry-built bottle-shaped well we went down with lights what do you think we found at the bottom of it perhaps uh, water i suggested water be damned said captain chester we found the mouldering skeleton of a very tall man in a sitting posture beside him lay a large rosary and a stout oak cudgel the rosary and cudgel i had seen in the phantom's hand the previous night my friend i had solved the problem that was the skeleton of the old prior of pittenham who vanished in that house hundreds of years ago End of story four. stories five and six of st andrew's ghost stories by william thomas linskill this librivox recording is in the public domain story five the true tale of the phantom coach 
the great curtain had fallen after the pantomime and i was standing chatting on the stage of the theatre at cambridge when one of the stagemen came to tell me i was wanted at the stage door and i must hurry up at once thither i proceeded and found a lot of golfing boys hunting boys dramatic boys and all sorts of other merry varsity boys who shouted out come along quick to the blue pig uh, the blue pig is a cambridge name for the blue boar hotel we want you to meet a fellow named willie carson and there is to be supper and he has something to tell us the bogeyman has gone on there now so come right away well off we went to the blue boar hotel and we found carson sitting over a blazing fire with a capital supper set in his nice old-fashioned room lit up with candles only the picture of comfort outside it was snowing hard and bitterly cold after a talk over the merits of the pantomime we did full justice to a most excellent supper and then crowded around the blazing hearth to hear a story our host wanted to tell us did you ever hear of the phantom coach at st andrews he asked turning to me suddenly and removing his cigar oh, often i replied i have heard most extraordinary yarns about it from lots of people but why do you ask because i've seen it he replied softly and thoughtfully some five years ago it was very very strange not to be forgotten and quite unexplainable that is why i asked you here to-night i wanted to talk to you about it he stooped over the fire and was silent for a few minutes tell us all about it we all shouted at once we won't make fun of it there is nothing to make fun of indeed it's a true solemn fact he said listen and i will try to tell you what i saw but i can't half picture it properly five years ago i had just come home from america i went to stay at st andrews for some golf i think it was the latter end of august and i must have been in the town about a week at least when one night it was hot and stuffy and about midnight i determined to take a good long country walk and struck out right along the road to strathkinnis it was a hot dark and stormy night not wet fitful black clouds floated now and again at a rapid pace over the moon which now and then shone out brightly in the distance the sea made a perpetual moan and at intervals the dark eastern sky was lit up by flashes of summer wildfire lightning over the distant cathedral towers now and again i could hear the mutter of far-away thunder and there were incessant gusts of wind i must have been about two miles along the road when i could discern some very large object approaching me rapidly as it came nearer i noticed it resembled a coach dark heavy primitive it seemed to have four large black horses and the driver was a muffled shapeless figure it approached me with a low humming or buzzing sound which was most peculiar and unpleasant to hear the horses made a hollow kind of ticking sound with their feet otherwise it was noiseless no earthly coach of the kind could go without any ordinary sound it was weird and eerie in the extreme as it passed me the moon shone out brightly and i saw for a second a ghastly white face at the coach window but i saw those four strange silent black horses the more extraordinary tall swaddled up shapeless driver and the quaint black gloomy old coach with a coffin-shaped box on the roof only far far too well one most remarkable thing was that it threw no shadow of any kind just as it passed me there was a terrific roar of thunder and a blaze of lightning that nearly blinded me and in the distance i saw that horrible ghastly receding coach then clouds came over the moon and all was black a darkness one could feel a darkness of a shut-up smothering vault i felt sick and dazed for a moment or two i could not make out if i had been struck by the lightning or was paralyzed however after a bit it passed off it was a horrible deathly feeling while it lasted i never experienced a similar sensation before or since and hope i never may again 
another very curious thing was the behaviour of my favourite collie dog usually frightened at nothing on the approach of the phantom for phantom it was he crouched down shivering and whining and as it drew nearer fled with a bark like a screech and cowered down in a ditch at the roadside and gave forth low growls i tell you boys it's all right in this room to talk about it but none of you would have liked to be in my place that queer uncanny night on that lonely road that it was supernatural i am convinced it is a very thin veil between us and the unseen world of spirits they say i possess a seventh sense namely second sight and i know i shall never forget that night's experience but listen the story is not ended yet next morning a telegram arrived from my brother in kent are you all right i wondered much and wired back that i was very well the following day a letter came from my brother giving me a curious explanation the following afternoon of the day i saw the coach my brother was looking out of the old manor house windows in kent when he and several others noticed a large bird having most peculiar plumage seated on the garden wall no one had ever seen a bird of the kind before he was rushing off for a gun to shoot it when our father who looked very white and scared stopped him do not shoot he said it would be of no use that is the bird of ill omen to all our race it only appears before a death i have only once seen it before that week your dear mother died my brother was so alarmed at this that he sent the wire i have mentioned to me at st andrews by the next mail from australia we learned that our eldest brother had died there the very day i saw the coach at st andrews and my brother saw the bird at our old home in kent very odd is it not but what do you know about that coach only tales i said many people swear they have heard it or seen it on stormy nights i know a girl who swears to it and also a doctor who passed it on the road and it nearly frightened his horse to death and him too the tale of the two tramps is funny they were trudging into st andrews one wild stormy night when this uncanny coach overtook them it stopped the door opened and a white hand beckoned towards them one tramp rushed up and got in then suddenly the door noiselessly shut and the coach moved off leaving the other tramp alone in the pitiless wind and rain i never saw my old mate again said the tramp when he told the tale and i never shall that there old coach was nothing of this here world of ours it took my old mate off to davy jones locker mighty smart poor fellow they say his body was found in the sea some months afterwards and the tale goes that the phantom coach finishes its nocturnal journey in the waves of st andrew's bay whose coach is it asked all that were in the room i cannot say some say bethune others sharp and others haxton i do not know who is supposed to be the figure inside unless it is his satanic majesty himself at all events it seems a certain fact that a phantom coach has been seen from time to time on the roads round st andrews i have never seen any of these things myself well said carson that awful coach does appear it appeared to me and doubtless in the course of time will appear to many others it bodes no one any good and i pity with all my heart any one who meets it beware of those roads late at night or like me you may some day to your injury meet that ghastly uncanny old phantom coach if so you will remember it to your dying day curious thing that about seeing the coach and the bird at the same time and in two places so far apart murmured the golfing johnny and then carson's brother dying too i'd sooner see the bird than the coach said one guess i'd rather not see either of them said an american present glad we have no phantom coaches in yankee land End of story five story six the veiled nun of st leonard's curiously enough although i have been in many old haunted castles and churches at the exactly correct hour viz midnight in scotland england wales and the rhine country yet i have never been able to either see or hear a ghost of any sort 
the only thing of the kind i ever saw was an accidental meeting with the far-famed spring-heeled jack in a dark lane at helensburgh it was many years ago and as i was then very small and he was of immense proportions the meeting was distinctly unpleasant for me now from legends we learn that st andrews is possessed of a prodigious number of supernatural appearances of different kinds sizes and shapes most of them of an awe-inspiring and blood-curdling type in fact so numerous are they eighty in number they seem to be that there is really no room for any modern aspirants who may want a quiet place to appear and turn people's hair white it might be well to mention a few of them before telling the tale of the veiled nun of st leonard's church avenue we will put aside ordinary banshees and things that can only be heard well there is the celebrated phantom coach that willie carson told us of it has been heard and seen by many there is also a white lady that used to haunt the abbey road the ghost of st rule's tower the haunted tower ghost the blackfriars ghost the wraith of haxton of Rayliot, the spectre of the old castle the dancing skeletons the smothered piper lad the phantom bloodhounds the priory ghost and many many more the nun of st leonard's is as curious and interesting as any of them though a bit weird and gruesome in the time of a charming mary stuart our white queen there lived in the old south street a very lovely lady belonging to a very old scottish family and her beauty and wit brought many admirers to claim her hand but with little or no success she waved them all away at last she became affianced to a fine and brave young fellow who came from the east lothian country and for some months all went merrily as a marriage bell but at last clouds overspread the rosy horizon she resolved that she would never become an earthly bride but would take the veil and become a bride of holy church a nun in point of fact when her lover heard that she had left home and entered a house of holy sisters he at once announced his intention of hastening to st andrews seizing her and marrying her at once in this project it would seem the young lady's parents were in perfect agreement with the devoted youth he did hasten to st andrews almost immediately and there received a terrible shock on meeting this once lovely and loved maiden he discovered that she had actually done what she had written and threatened to do sooner than be an earthly bride she had mutilated her face by slitting her nostrils she had cut off her eyelids and both her top and bottom lips and had branded her fair cheeks with cruel hot irons the poor youth on seeing her famous beauty thus destroyed fled to edinburgh where he committed suicide and she after becoming a nun died from grief and remorse that all happened nearly four hundred years ago but her spirit with the terribly marred and mutilated face still wanders a nights in the peaceful little avenue to old st leonard's iron kirk gate down the pens road she is all dressed in black with a long black veil over the once lovely face and carries a lantern in her hand should any bold visitor to that avenue meet her she slowly sweeps her face veil aside raises the lantern to her scarred face and discloses those awful features to his horrified gaze here is a curious thing that i know happened there a few years ago i knew a young fellow here who was reading up theology and church canon law i also knew a great friend of his an old cambridge man the former i will call wilson and the latter talbot as i do not want to give the exact names well wilson had invited talbot up to st andrews for a month of golf and he arrived here on a christmas day he came to my rooms for about ten minutes and i never saw any one merrier and brighter and full of old days at cambridge then he hurried off to see the links and the club late that evening wilson rushed in come along quick and see talbot he's awfully ill and i don't know what's up a bit i went off and found talbot in his lodgings with the doctor in attendance and he certainly looked dangerously ill and seemed perfectly dazed 
wilson told me that he had to go to see some people on business that evening down by the harbour and that he took talbot with him down the pens road it was a fine night and talbot said he would walk around the road and enjoy a cigar till his friend's return in about half an hour wilson returned up the pens road but could see talbot nowhere in sight after hunting about for a long time he found him leaning against the third or fourth tree up the little avenue to st leonard's kirk gate he went up to him when talbot turned a horrified face towards him saying oh my god have you come to me again and fell down in a fit or a swoon he got some passer-by to help to take poor talbot to his rooms then he came round for me we sat up with him in wonder and amazement and briefly this is what he told us after walking up and down the pens road he thought he would take a survey of the little avenue when at the end he saw a light approaching him and he turned back to meet it thinking it was a policeman he wished him good evening but got no reply on approaching nearer he saw it to be a veiled female with a lantern getting quite close she stopped in front of him drew aside her long veil and held up the lantern towards him my god said talbot i can never forget or describe that terrible fearful face i felt choked and i fell like a log at her feet i remember no more till i found myself in these rooms and you two fellows sitting beside me i leave this place to-morrow and he did by the first train his state of panic was terrible to see neither wilson nor talbot had ever heard the tale of the awful apparition of the st leonard's nun and i had almost forgotten the existence of the strange story till so curiously reminded of it i never saw talbot again but i had a letter from him a year after written from reenfels telling me that on christmas day he had had another vision dream or whatever it was of the same awful spectre about a year later i read in a paper that poor old talbot had died on christmas night at rosario of heart failure i often wonder if the dear old chap had had another visit from the terrible veiled nun of st leonard's avenue end of story six story seven of st andrew's ghost stories by william thomas linskill this librivox recording is in the public domain story seven the monk of st rule's tower some years ago i was perfectly surrounded with crowds of bonny children in the st albans holborn district of london i fancy they belonged to some guild or other and they enacted the part of imps fairies statues and so forth in various pantomimes in neighbouring theatres i had been invited there to amuse the kiddies with songs and imitations and now they were all shrieking and yelling at the top of their voices for a ghost story it's getting near christmas they all shouted and we all want to hear about ghosts real creepy ghosts i pointed out the fact that most ghost stories were bunkum and that such tales were very apt to keep wee laddies and lassies awake at night but bless you they wouldn't listen to that one bit they wanted ghosts and ghosts they would have well in about an hour i had yarned off most of my best bogey stories i had used up most of my tales regarding scottish english and continental castles and the banshees water kelpies wraiths and so forth connected therewith but still those children like oliver twist demanded more i really was fairly stumped when all of a sudden my mind flew back to eighteen seventy five when a strange story was told me by captain chester in the corsal grounds at beautiful baden baden i first fell in with this dear old warrior in rome and we became firm friends and travelled together for many cheery weeks he told me his queer tale in the very strongest of military language which i must omit the language would be suitable to use in bunkers but not on paper it was a sultry day and so were his remarks it would seem that many years before he had visited scotland and england to try and see a ghost or two he had been to cumnorhurst in order to investigate the appearances of ill-fated amy robsart 
he went to raynham hall to interview the famous brown lady and he journeyed to hampton court to hear the shrieking ghost and also went to church strelton to see if he could fix the ghost at the copper hole in scotland he followed the scent of various ghosts and finally landed in st andrews by jove sir he said that's the place for ghosts every blessed corner is full of them bang full look at those fellows in the castle dungeons and beaten and sharp and the men that got hanged and burned and the old dev i mean witches i saw my ghost there years and years ago i took an old house in st andrews which was a small place then very little golf was played and there was very little to do but gad sir the ghosts were thick and the quaint old bodies in the town were full of them they could spin yarns for hours about phantom coaches death knells corpse candles people going about in winding sheets phantom hearses and lord knows what else i loved it it took me quite back to the middle ages so i told these children captain chester's tale as nearly as possible in his own words minus the forcible epithets i managed to hit off his voice and manner and this in particular seemed to amuse the barons egad sir he said it was a curious time of all the tales i heard the one that pleased and fascinated me most was the legend of the monk that looks over st regulus's tower on moonlit nights i went thither every night and constantly fancied i saw a figure peering over the edge but was not certain then i got hold of a very old man who related to me the old legend it seems that years ago there was a good prior of st andrews named robert de montrose he ruled well gently and wisely but among the monks there was one who was always in hot water and whom prior robert had often to haul over the coals he played practical jokes often absented himself from the daily and nightly offices of holy kirk and otherwise upset the rules and discipline finally when earl douglas and his retinue came to st andrews to present to the cathedral a costly statue long known as the douglas lady this monk made desperate love to one of the waiting women of lady douglas for this he was imprisoned in the priory dungeon for some days it was the custom of robert de montrose almost every fine night to ascend the tower of st rule and admire the view the summit was reached in those days by means of ladders and wooden landings not as it is now by a stair in those days too the apse and part of the nave were still standing and the summit of the solemn old tower was crowned by a small spire one evening just before yuletide when the prior as usual was on the top of the tower the contumacious monk slyly followed him up the ladders stabbed him in the back with a small dagger and flung him over the north side of the old tower i thought captain chester i said that the murder took place on the dormitory stairs gadzooks and odd bodkins sir i am telling you what i was told and what i can prove sir all right i replied please fire away well continued chester they told me the prior had often been seen since peeping over the tower and at times he was seen to fall as he did years ago from the summit by the by his assassin was starved to death and buried in some old midden one moonlight night as my brother and i were standing on the kirk hill to our horror and amazement we saw a figure appear suddenly on the top of the tower leap on to the parapet and deliberately jump over zound sir my blood ran cold we did not hesitate long but climbed the low wall of the cathedral it was easily done in those days and we were young and active and hurried to the grim old tower just as we neared it a monk passed us in the augustinian habit his cowl was thrown back and for just one second we had a view of his pallid handsome face and keen penetrating eyes then he disappeared as suddenly as he had appeared we were alone in the moonlight nothing stirring that is very odd i said zooks sir i have odder things still to tell you we went home to the old house had supper and retired to bed thoughtfully i woke about two a m the blinds were up and it was as clear as day with the moonlight 
imagine my blank astonishment when i clearly perceived leaning up against the mantelpiece the pallid monk i had seen a few hours before near the square tower he leaned on his elbow and was gazing intently at me while in his hand he held some object that had a blue glitter in the moonbeams he smiled fear not brother he said i am prior robert of montrose who quitted this earth many years since and of whom you have been talking and thinking so much of late days i saw you to-night in our cruelly ruined abbey kirk alas alas but i come from ayont the distant hills and have far to go to-night what do you want holy father i said and what of your murder that is forgiven and forgotten long sin he said and i love to revisit at times my old haunts and so does he you have in your regiment methinks one named montrose a zion of our family yes i said i know bob montrose well see you this dagger i hold said prior robert it was with this i lost my life on this earth many years sin in the tower of blessed st rule they buried it with me in my stone kist i will leave it here with you to give to my kinsman for it will prove of use to him ere he pass hence mark my words he raised his hand as in an act of blessing and melted away i fell back in a sleep or in a faint when i woke the morning sun was streaming into my bedroom at first i thought i had eaten too much supper and had a nightmare but there on the table by my bed lay an old dagger of curious workmanship the dagger that slew the prior years and years ago i faithfully fulfilled my vow and my friend major bob montrose has now got his monkish ancestor's dagger that's all captain chester told me dear children good-bye don't forget me and do not forget old st andrew's ghosts the tower of st rule and the spectre of prior robert of montrose then a modern hansom whirled me away to king's cross end of story seven story eight related by captain chester in my travels i have met many very extraordinary and remarkable people with hobbies and fads of various kinds but i never met a man of such curious personality as this old friend of mine captain chester all his methods and ideas were purely original every one has some hobby his hobby was ghost and spook hunting we were sitting one lovely september evening in the gardens of one of the hotels at bonn which stretched down to the river rhine listening to the band and watching the great rafts coming down the river from the black forest by jove sir said the old man i have shot big game in the rockies and hunted tigers and all that sort of thing but zooks sir i prefer hunting ghosts any day that robert de montrose was the first i saw there are shoals of these shades about a perfect army of them everywhere especially in st andrews gad sir you should hear the banshee shrieking at night in the irish bogs i don't believe in your infernal sea serpents but i've seen water kelpies in the scottish and american lakes i told him i had never heard a banshee or even a water kelpie very likely sir very probable every one can't see and hear these things i can i told him i had never seen a disembodied spirit and didn't want to gadzooks sir i consider disinspirited bodies far worse they are quite common i allude to human bodies that have lost their spirits or souls and yet go about among us zounds sir my cousin is one of them ah he continued detached personality is a curious thing i can detach my personality can you most certainly not i said what the deuce do you mean mean he said i mean my spirit can float out of my body at will my spirit becomes a sort of mental balloon i can then defy destiny how in thunder do you manage to do it anyway by practice sir of course when my spirit floats out of my body i can see my own old body sitting in my armchair and an ugly old wreck of a body it is it is bad for one i admit it is very weakening 
another thing may happen another wandering spirit may suddenly take possession of one's body and then one's own spirit can't get back again and it becomes a wandering spirit and is always trying to force itself into other people's bodies then one spirit gets into a mental bunker see i don't see a bit it is most unpleasant tell me about ghosts you have seen and about that dagger you gave major montrose oh so then you are not interested in eliminated personality not a bit i said i don't know what it is tell me about that dagger for a change ah oh, well the dagger robert montrose gave me proved of great use to my old friend bob montrose on many occasions it had a wonderful power of its own once he got into a broil with a lot of spanish fellows one night and as he was unarmed at the time he was in a remarkably tight corner suddenly something slipped into his hand and by jove sir it was the dagger and that dagger saved his life another time he found himself in an american train with a raving lunatic and if it had not been for the protecting dagger he'd have been torn limb from limb after that he took it everywhere with him where is it now well there's an odd thing if you like bob died in the isle of france where paul and virginia used to be he was killed by a fall and is buried there he left the dagger to me in his will but no human eyes have ever seen that dagger since his death it may have been stolen or it may have gone back to where it came from into robert of montrose's stone kissed in the old chapter house at st andrew's cathedral probably its usefulness was at an end and it was needed no more bob told me one queer thing about that dagger once a year near christmas tide the dagger hung on the wall of his bedroom it used to exude a thick reddish fluid like blood which used to cover the blade in large drops and it remained so for several hours and again sometimes at night it used to shine with a bright light of its own that is indeed wonderful i said lighting another cheroot but tell me more about the st andrews boggles astral bodies dual personality and things of that kind depress me a bit well that is odd said old chester i love them when i was in st andrews i rented a fine old house with huge thick walls big fireplaces funny corkscrew stairs such rum holes and corners and big vaulted kitchens it's all pulled down now i believe and a brand new house built but i hear the vaulted rooms below are left exactly as they were people didn't take to the old house they heard noises and rappings and saw things in the night and so on we all saw such things my brother met the ghost of a horrible-looking old witch quite in the orthodox dress on the witch hill above the witch lake it upset him terribly at the time made him quite ill nerves went all to pot would not sleep in a room by himself after that he made me devilish angry sir i can tell you perhaps it was mother allison crake a well-known witch who was burnt there likely enough sir it may have been the old cat you mention an old hag then my nephew and i saw that phantom coach in the abbey walk one windy moonlight night it passed us very quickly but made a deuced row like a lifeboat carriage what was it like like a huge black box with windows in it and a queer light inside it reminded me of a great coffin ugly-looking affair very uncanny thing to meet at that time of night and in such a lonely spot it was soon gone but we heard its rumbling noise for a long time what were the horses like shadowy looking black things like great black beetles with long thin legs and what was the driver like i asked he was a tall thin black object also like a big black lank lobster with a cocked hat on the top that's all i could see on the top of the coach was an object that looked like a gigantic tarantula spider with a head like a moving gargoyle i can't get at the real history of that mysterious old coach yet i don't believe it has anything whatever to do with the murdered prelates beaten or sharp however the coach does go about another wraith i saw at the castle of st andrews was that of james hepburn earl of bothell third husband of mary queen of scots 
he lies buried in the crypt of fairvel church close to the catgut before his death he was a prisoner at malmo then he was sent to denmark and died in the dungeon of the state prison at draxholm i am awfully interested i said about those times and in bothell and mary in particular odds fish sir said chester so am i i went to fairvale to see bothell's well-preserved body the verger took me down a trap-door near the altar and there it lies in a lidless box a very fine face with a cynical and mocking mouth he murdered darnley and he was treated and buried as a murderer in those bygone days at malmo folks say he was tormented by the ghosts of his mad wife jane huntley and by darnley he ended his days in misery and serve him devilish well right say i i love and revere lovely mary stuart damn it sir he deserted her when she was in a fix at carberry hill the curmudgeon but what of the appearances of the earl you saw met him twice at the castle no mistaking him a big knightly handsome fellow spirits can easily at times assume their earthly form and dress i recognized him at once the sneering lips and all just like his pictures too when he glided past me his teeth were chattering like a dice-box and the wind was whistling through his neck-bones i addressed him boldly by name but he melted away one sees these apparitions with one's mental eyes i saw him again leaning against the door that leads to that oubliette in the sea-tower of the castle egad sir he exactly resembled the body i saw in the old crypt of farvale he often appears there and at hermitage castle also no mistake sir that was hepburn the earl of bothell i must tell you some other time it's getting very late now of the ghosts i saw in my house at st andrews and of the prior or monk of pitymum i must turn into bed now i go to the service at the cathedral here early to-morrow then the tall figure of captain chester strode away and left me alone to my meditations well i suppose if i had been captain chester left alone there in those gardens i'd have seen a ghost or two with my mental eyes but instead i saw a fat waiter approaching who told me my supper awaited me End of story eight. stories nine and ten of st andrew's ghost stories by william thomas linskill this librivox recording is in the public domain story nine the screaming skull of greyfriars i never met a better fellow in the world than my old friend alan beecham he had been educated at eton and maudlin in oxford after which he joined a crack regiment and later on took it into his head to turn doctor he was a great traveller and a magnificent athlete there was no game in which he did not excel curiously enough he hated music he had no ear for it and he did not know the difference between the airs of tommy make room for your uncle and the lost chord he was tremendously proud of his pedigree he had descended from the de beechams and one of his ancestors he gravely informed people had helped noah to get the wasps and elephants into the ark another of them seems to have been not very far away in the garden of eden in fact they seem to have been quite prehistoric he was quite cracked on the subject of brain transference telepathy spiritualism ghosts warnings and the like and on these points he was most uncanny and fearsome the literature he had about them was blood-curdling he believed in dual personality and in visions horoscopes and dreams he showed me a pamphlet he had written entitled the toad-faced demon of lone devil's dyke he was always flitting about britain exploring haunted houses and castles and sleeping in haunted rooms when it was possible some years ago beecham and myself accompanied by his faithful valet rejoicing in the name of pellingham truffles went to the highlands for a bit of quiet and rest and it was there i heard his curious story of the skull we were sitting over a cosy fire after dinner it was snowing hard outside and very cold our pipes were alight and our grog on the table when alan beecham suddenly remarked it's a deuced curious thing for a man to be always followed about the place by a confounded grinning skull 
a what i said who in the deuce is being followed about by a skull it's rubbish and quite impossible not a bit said my friend i've had a skull after me more or less for several years it sounds like a remark a lunatic would make i rejoined rather crossly do not talk bunkum you'll go dotty if you believe such infernal rot it is not bunkum or rot a bit said allan it's gospel truth ask truffles ask jack weston or jimmy darkgood or any of my south country pals i don't know jack weston or jimmy darkgood i said but tell me the whole story and some day if it's good i'll put it in the st andrew's citizen it's mostly about st andrew said beecham so here goes but shove on some coals first i did so and then requested him to fire away it was long long ago i think about the year fifteen thirteen that one of my ancestors a man named neville de beecham resided in scotland it seemed he was an uncommonly wild dog went in for racing and cards and could take his wine and ale with any of them even in those hard-drinking days he was known as flash neville later on he married a pretty girl the daughter of a silk mercer in perth who it seems died they say of a broken heart two years after neville de beecham was seized with awful remorse and became shortly after a monk in greyfriars monastery at st andrews after neville's wife's death her relations seemed to have been on the hunt after him burning for revenge and the girl's brother a rough wild dog in those stormy days at last managed to track his quarry down in the monastery at st andrews very interesting i said that monastery stood very nearly on the site of the present infant school and we found the well in eighteen eighty well what did this brother do eh it seems that one afternoon after vespers he forced his way into the monastery chapel sought out neville de beecham and slashed off his head with a sword in the aisle of the kirk now a queer thing happened his body fell on the floor but the severed head with a wild scream flew up to the chapel ceiling and vanished through its roof mighty queer that i said the body was reverently buried went on allan but the head never was recovered and whirling through the air over the monastery screaming and groaning most pitifully it used to cause great terror to the monks and others and knights it was a well-known story and few cared to venture in that locality after nightfall the head soon became a skull and since that time has always haunted some member of the house of beecham now comes a strange thing i went a few years ago and lived in rooms at st andrews for a change and while there i heard of my uncle's death somewhere abroad i had never seen him but i had frequently heard that he was very much perplexed and worried by the tender attentions paid him by the skull of neville de beecham which was always turning up at odd times and in unexpected places this is a grand tale i said now i come on the job said allan ruefully that uncle was the very last of our family and i wondered if that skull would come my way i felt very ill and nervous after i got the news of my uncle's death a strange sense of depression and oppression came over me and i got very restless one stormy evening i felt impelled by some strange influence to go out i wandered about the place for several hours and got drenched i felt as if i was walking in my sleep or as if i had taken some drug or other then i had a sort of vision i had just rounded the corner of north bell street now called greyfriars garden i remarked yes well when i got around that corner i saw a large strange building before me i opened a wicked gate and entered what i found to be the chapel service was over the lights were being extinguished and the air was laden with incense as i knelt in a corner of the chapel i saw the whole scene the tragedy of which i had heard enacted all over again i saw that monk in the aisle i saw a man rush in and cut off his head i saw the body fall and the head fly up with a shriek to the roof when i came to myself i found i was sitting on the low wall of the school i was very cold and wet and i got up to go home 
as i rose i saw lying on the pavement at my feet what appeared to be a small football i gave it a vicious kick when to my horror it turned over and i saw it was a skull it was gnashing its teeth and moaning then with a shriek it flew up in the air and vanished a horrible thing then i knew the worst the skull of the monk neville de beecham had attached itself to me for life i being the last of the race since then it is almost always with me where is it now i said shuddering not very far away you bet he said it's a most unpleasant tale i said good night i'm off to bed after that i was in my first sleep about an hour afterward when a knock came at my door and the valet came in sorry to disturb you sir he said but the skull has just come back it's in the next room would you like to see it certainly not i roared get away and let me go to sleep then and there i firmly resolved to leave next morning i hated skulls and i fancied that probably it might take a fancy to me and i had no desire to be followed about the country by a skull as if it was a fox terrier next morning i went in to breakfast where is that beastly skull i said to alan oh it's off again somewhere heaven knows where but i have had another vision a waking vision what was it well said alan i saw the skull and a white hand which seemed to beckon to me beside it then they slowly receded and in their place was what looked like a big sheet of paper on it in large letters were the words your friend jack weston is dead this morning i got this wire telling me of his sudden death read it that afternoon i left the highlands and alan beecham since then i have constant letters from him from his home in england he has tried every means possible to get rid of that monk's skull but they are of no avail it always returns so he has made the best he can of it and keeps it in a locked casket in an empty room at the end of a wing of the old house he says it keeps fairly quiet but on stormy nights wails and gruesome shrieks are heard from the casket in that closed apartment i heard from him last week he said dear w t l i don't think i mentioned that twice a year the skull of neville de beecham vanishes from its casket for a period of about two days it is never away longer i wonder if it still haunts its old monastery at st andrews where its owner was slain do write and tell me if any one now in that vicinity hears or sees the screaming skull of my ancestor neville de beecham End of story nine story ten the spectre of the castle several years had elapsed since i met the butler of lowsdry castle in the highland inn i had just come up from the south of england for some golf and fresh air and was looking over my letters one morning at breakfast when i opened the following missive lowsdry castle sir yours to command sir i have not forgot our pleasant talk on that snowy night up in the far north when you were pleased to be interested in my experience of lowsdry could you very kindly meet me any day and time you wish to fix at lashers and oblige your obedient servant jeremiah anklebone p s i have something to divulge to you connected with st andrews that may absorb your mind accordingly i fixed up arrangements and met mr anklebone in lucia's where we went to the nearest hostelry and ordered the best lunch they had there jeremiah looked thinner older and whiter than when i last saw him doubtless owing to his frequent communing with spirits how is lowsdry getting on i meekly inquired and what of the ghost it is getting on fine sir i have had a number of new experiences since i had the pleasure of seeing you last you must understand sir that my family for generations have been favoured with occult powers my father was a great seer and my great-grandfather mr crockety anklebone of the isle of sky was a wonderful visionary now anklebone was an interesting old fellow but he had a tiresome habit of wandering away from his theme and as it were getting off the main road into a labyrinth of byways and one had metaphorically to push him out of these side lanes and place him on his feet again on the main road 
before i come to st andrew's castle he said i must tell you about a queer episode of an astral body at lowsdry a disentangled personality as it were push along i said and tell me well one afternoon after luncheon the master and i were in the dining-room when we saw a gentleman crossing the lawn towards the castle he was a tall man in a riding-dress with curly hair and a large flowing moustache he came up to the window and looked in earnestly at us and then walked along the gravel walk round to the castle door hello said the master that is my old friend jack herbert to whom i have let lowsdry for this summer what on earth can bring him here i'll go to the door myself and let him in he never said he was coming in a minute or two the master came back looking bewildered ankle-bone he said there's a very queer thing there is nobody there perhaps i suggested the gentleman has gone round to the stables so we both hurried off to look but not a sign of any one could be seen and then we stared blankly at each other we could not make it out two days after the master got a letter from mr jack herbert telling him he had had a bad fall off his horse had injured his spine and was confined to bed mr herbert went on to say that two days before while he was asleep he dreamt vividly that he was at lowsdry that he crossed the lawn to the window of the dining hall and looking in saw my master and the butler uh, that's me in the room he was going round to the front door when he awoke now that was his astral body that master and i saw he loved lowsdry and during sleep he came and paid us that visit queer isn't it ten days after he died he wanted to see the old castle before he died and his force of will-power brought his double self or astral body to visit us it is not so uncommon as people think numbers of people are seen in two places at once far apart look at archbishop sharp of st andrews he was in edinburgh at holyrood i think and sent his servant over post haste to st andrews to bring back some papers he had forgotten there when his trusty servant went up to his study in the novum hospitium to get the papers from the desk lo there was the archbishop sitting in his usual chair and scowling at him he told the archbishop this when he returned with the papers to edinburgh but his grace sternly bade him be silent and mention the matter to no one on pain of death now sir it seems that my master is able to see astral bodies for he saw mr jack herbert but i doubt if he could see a real spirit perhaps sir suggested anklebone politely you might be able to see astral bodies thank you very much indeed i replied but i'm blank if i want to see anything of the sort but i have heard a tale of an eminent man in london who took a nap in his armchair every afternoon and while asleep appeared to his friends in different parts of the country but i doubt the fact very much ah said the butler very solemnly only about one in a thousand has the power of visualizing real spirits many ordinary persons have long sight and some have short sight but most people are short-sighted when ghosts are visible the ghosts are really there all the time some people cannot see them but can feel their presence or touch only most animals can see spirits sometimes they are killed with terror when they see the spirits i pulled the bell rope and ordered some spirits for the butler i don't think that will kill you with terror i said when it arrived he looked grateful and remarked that talking was dry work however interesting the subject might be now look here mr anklebone i said you know i dare say the stories about the cathedral the haunted tower and all that please tell me what your experiences have been there anklebone's whole appearance suddenly changed he gripped my arm violently shivered and shuddered and turned ghastly pale i thought he was going to have a fit for pity's sake sir he said trembling ask me nothing about that there is something too terrible there but i dare not reveal what i know and have seen to any one do not allude to it again or it will drive me mad he lay back in his chair for a few moments with his eyes closed and shaking all over but he gradually recovered his usual appearance i wish to tell you about the castle spectre he said weakly 
i must confess that i felt nonplussed and disappointed at the turn the conversation had taken as whatever my private opinion was regarding the worthy jeremiah's curious statements still i felt anxious to find out his experiences at the cathedral particularly however i swallowed my disappointment like a trojan and begged him to proceed he gulped down his spirits and informed me he felt better again but he did not seem quite himself for some time well sir he said i often used to climb over the castle wall after dusk and smoke my pipe and meditate on all the grand folk that must have been there in bygone days before the smash-up i thought of lovely young queen mary of mary hamilton and her other marys of lord darnley of the poet castellar of lord arran and the duke of rothsey and all the stuart kings that used to be there then i thought of prior hepburn and poor murdered cardinal beaton and of monks knights and lovely wenches that used to frequent the old place i loved it for i have read history a lot one could not help thinking of the feasting revelry and pageants of those interesting old times and the grand services in the churches and what fine dresses everybody wore i saw he was going bang off the subject again and when he began to tell me there were lots of ankle bones in norman times about fifeshire i had to pull him back with a jerk to his ghost at the castle very well sir i was in the castle one evening and i was sitting on the parapet of the old wall when i saw a head appearing up the old broken steps on the east side of the castle that once led down to the great dining hall i knew no one could now come up that way without a ladder from the sea beach and when the figure got to the level ground it came right through the iron railing just as if no obstruction were there i stared hard and watched the advancing figure it looked like a woman i had heard of the cardinal's ghost and wondered if it could be his eminence himself nearer and nearer it came and although it was a gusty evening i noticed the flowing garments of the approaching figure were quite still and unruffled by the wind it was like a moving statue as it passed me slowly a few yards away i saw they were not the robes of a cardinal but those of an archbishop i am a churchman and know the garments quite well i saw all his vestments clearly and i shall never forget the pale ashen set face and the thin determined mouth then i noticed one very very strange thing the statuesque tall figure had a thick rope round the neck and the end of the rope was trailing along the grass behind it but there was no sound whatever on it went and began to climb the stairs to the upper apartments i tried to follow but could not move for a bit i felt as if i was mesmerized or paralyzed i was all in a cold sweat too and i was glad to get away from the castle at last and hurry home i haven't gone so fast for many years when i went next day to lorsdry i made a clean breast of the whole affair to master would you know him again he asked me ay i replied i would know that face and figure among a thousand come to the study said the master and i will show you some pictures we went and i looked over a number of them at last i came to one that fairly transfixed me there was no mistaking the face before me was the picture of the spectre i had seen the previous night in the ruined castle of st andrews well anklebone said the master this is really wonderful and you actually saw the rope round his neck i did i said as i am a living man but who is it it is not the cardinal no said the master very gravely this man was publicly hanged by his enemies on a gibbet at the market cross of stirling on april first fifteen seventy one but who was he i asked imploringly the man or ghost you saw said master was archbishop john hamilton of st andrews in his own castle grounds where he once reigned supreme i said farewell to mr anklebone and as i thought over his extraordinary story journeying home in the train i could not help repeating over and over again to myself that very curious name that seemed to rhyme with the motion of the train crickle anklebone end of story ten